Good afternoon. My name is Bobby, and I am honored to serve as the executive director of the Coalition of Urban and Metropolitan Universities, or CUMU. And we're co located here at Towson University in Towson, Maryland. Thank you for joining us today. As you could probably tell from a little bit of an audio glitch, this is our live stream. And we have over 750 higher education and community leaders registered. Each of you play a vital role in the CUMU community which has for over 30 years created spaces for shared learning, connecting, and action. I hope that you've seen our just announced learning and sharing virtual series that's debuting this coming fall for KUMU members. It's going to center on the most pressing challenges we are all facing in our work today. Please consider submitting a proposal to present or facilitate. We need your voices and expertise. Today's forum is a key step in Kumu's commitment to move beyond rhetoric and towards lasting change when it comes to combating systematic racism and inequities. Our discussion today is gonna to be moderated by Fred DeSam Lazaro, a PBS NewsHour journalist who focuses his reporting on issues that are of great importance to our Kumu members, social innovation, alleviating poverty and racial justice. I am thrilled to welcome Fred, who will introduce our esteemed group of Kumu presidents and challenges, presidents and chancellors. Thank you again for joining us for today's live stream. Fred. Thanks so much, Bobby, and welcome everyone. I'm going to abbreviate introductions and bios uh, and just try to launch as quickly as possible into the conversation um, that we are about to to have, and I have every confidence based on getting to know the four panelists, that it'll be a spirited one. Your, geog your geographic location, I suspect of most of your campuses, informs very much your modus operandi and very profoundly your missions. And we're gathered today to address what uh, an increasing chorus of municipalities are calling a public health threat, which is racism. You are in the epicenter of this public health threat. The city of Minneapolis, from where this is coming to you, uh, declared it officially so, that racism is a public health crisis. And it's elevated anti-racism efforts from the personal to systemic, as Bobby alluded to. We're going to hear from, the, from four thinkers who you've probably heard off if you haven't actually heard them. Each is a leader of a campus. Each is what in my business we call a walking soundbite. And my job is to keep those to about PBS news hour length um, so that we can move the conversation along. One of the ground rules that we established early on is that we're not gonna make this a show and tell about previous efforts in pursuit of diversity or anti-racism goals, unless these initiatives illustrate how complicated and difficult these goals are to attain. I'm charged with keeping us in this moment and looking forward to see whether the George Floyd aftermath can generate measurable progress that hasn't happened or hasn't happened enough in previous such incidents dating at least in our modern me uh, mass media era to Emmett Till. Could the politics, sociology, economics, demographics, or technology make things different this time? Do our speakers, leaders of anchor institutions in their urban space have unique opportunities as presidents to move the proverbial needle? And what are those? We've collected uh, dozens of questions that have come in from, uh, from you, the audience, and almost all of them fold into the theme of our conversation today. And if you have specific questions that we don't get to directly, Kumu is obviously the very logical exchange to facilitate this ongoing conversation. So as we say in my business, stay tuned and go to Kumu's website uh, frequently. So with mu without much further ado, I'd like to move us along and begin with you, Kate, Dr. Conway Turner, Turner at SUNY Buffalo State, a question I'd like each of our guests to kick in with as we move along. How has the George Floyd 
killing ricocheted on your campus generally and what opportunities are you seizing in its wake? And feel free to personalize this, how much personal stake you see uh, in your own mandate um, in answering that question. Well, thank you so much uh, for the question, uh, Fred. It's a pleasure to be here with my colleagues uh, to talk about this very important issue that we face. Um, the George Floyd moment um, ricocheted in many ways across our campus. As a campus, of course, we um, are well aware of the um, centuries of discrimination that African-Americans have experienced. We are a social justice campus, so there's much discussion and work uh, that we do um, both on campus and throughout the community as a, uh, an anchor institution. And so the issue itself, the broad issue of racism, um, systemic racism was not new to our campus, but that eight minutes and 46 seconds of seeing what happened in the death of, of George Floyd certainly was a tipping point. It was a extreme you know, hit in the gut, you might say, of, of a realization that for all the work uh, that people have thought they have been doing and have been attempting, that we are still here at this moment. Uh, our campus also is a highly diverse campus. 55% of our students are students of color. And so people felt it deeply. It was, it was us, it was our brothers, it was our sisters, it was our, our family that this was happening to. Uh, so it was a profound shaking up of our community, every um, uh, part of our community. We're in Buffalo, New York, as you mentioned, which is the second largest city in New York, a very diverse city as well as our campus is, and a, a, a community that has really worked through issues um, for many years around racism. And so it, it was an awakening and a tipping uh, and a stripping off of, of any, any hope that we had that we were in a better place than we are now. And so it did cause um, you know, quite a severe reaction uh, for, our family, for our family campus and our community around us. And so the issue for us is then what's next? You know, uh, so we cannot deny the reality. We see the problem. We understand the difficultness of it. We understand how long-term this has been going on. Uh, we see the manifestations of, of uh, racism in terms of incarceration, uh, killings, health disparities, educational disparities, wealth, income. So what is next? And so we have already on our campus uh, deepened our discussions and our work in this area. So uh, coming together to really think about, you know, more than just understanding more deeply, but what are the appropriate actions? And for college campuses, you know, I wanna start the, the discussion by saying, well, what do we need to do? We're a microcosm of the larger community. We need to look internally. We need to make sure that the processes and processes and policies and the behaviors of our campus really have eradicated uh, and continue to move forward to be anti-racist. Um, so we need to have those discussions. We need to look at, you know, what's happening on our campuses. We need to look at the who we, who we hold up, who we ex exalt on our campus, who we memorialize. You know, um, how do we recruit uh, on our campus, whether students, faculty, or, or staff? Uh, how do we make sure we're putting people out into the world that are graduate from our campuses that will be thought leaders and anti-racist in the world? So it really, there's lots of work that's going on now that's been deepened uh, by this space. And I really feel that uh, people's eyes are open wider now to understand how the time is now. How can we capitalize on this special moment right now? We cannot waste this moment the moment where people are understanding the reality of racism. And so that's okay. where we are. We're beginning with that realization. Okay, and I look forward to getting into specifics once we get uh, a round robin going amongst all four of our leaders today. I'd like to go next to you, uh, Paul Pribinow, uh, president of Augsburg University, and your campus is a very short few blocks from 38th in Chicago, which is now George Floyd Square in Minneapolis. Uh, tell us a little bit about what happened in the immediate ma aftermath on your campus and perhaps a little digest of your campus's history 
will be illustrative because it, it uh, was not of the social milieu that's around you today. That's exactly right. Fred, well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> good to be with uh, all of you, especially with my um, good friends and colleagues here on this panel. So as Fred said, uh, Augsburg University um, is located just uh, a couple of miles from the George Floyd uh, site of where he was murdered. It were about a mile away from the third precinct police headquarters, which was abandoned and uh, destroyed in the violent uh, protests that followed the, the murder. Um, so Augsburg is um, a, a university that is located um, in one of the most diverse zip codes uh, in the United States. Um, all, all of our neighbors are immigrants, Somali and uh, Ethiopian and uh, Vietnamese and Korean. And so it's a fascinating place and context. Um, Augsburg itself just finished its celebration of its 150th anniversary. Um, so uh, quite a year uh, to celebrate that uh, sesquicentennial. Uh, but over the past 15 years, this is my 15th year as Augsburg's president, um, uh, we have seen a radical transformation of our student body. Um, so given that I'm the only private institution in this panel, to say a little bit about that, we have seen um, our uh, undergraduate population now become um, about the same as, uh, as SUNY Buffalo, about 55% students of color. It's a remarkable transformation over that period of time. And so the immediate aftermath of this moment, um, uh, in some ways uh, energizes us, brings momentum, brings um, urgency to the work that we were about already because of the students and the neighbors that we have the privilege to have as part of our community. And, and for me, that's really the, uh, you know, personally, um, uh, the aftermath of the murder, of uh, whether it was the peaceful protests where our students, uh, especially our black and brown students were putting their bodies in the line um, out in these protests. And, and you know, then with the violence that was un unraveling all around us and uh, you know, however that was being caused, the looting, I, I, I happen to live uh, in a presidential home, which is just a block off of Lake Street, which is where uh, the, was sort of the epicenter of this work. So this brings us to a point where I think at Augsburg where um, uh, given our location, our, our place, given our population, our demographic, our student body, um, the urgency here, uh, it's raw. I think that's really the way I would uh, describe it. It's raw in that our students, um, they want action. Um, they want to know that our commitment to being an anti-racist place, which we've claimed and aspired to for going back 10, 12 years in terms of even at our highest level of governance, um, they want to see that in action. They want to know what difference it's going to make. And I know we're going to have a chance to talk about some specific uh, initiatives uh, here uh, as part of our conversation. But I, I think that's the, the feeling I'm getting personally uh, is that um, uh, this is the moment that Kate described where um, the students we have the privilege to serve in the neighborhoods that we have a privilege to be a part of now demand this of us. Um, and, um, and I know that I'm spending a, a huge amount of my time of trying to think about what I as a president can do appropriately to create the space for that to happen, to, uh, to challenge our community to live into its aspirations. And I think that that um, is made only more um, kind of urgent by where we happen to be located, though I know this has also had an impact in lots of other cities across the country. Okay, and I look forward to hearing about Augsburg's pivot over that 150 year history from serving the original, the originally intended students that, uh, that it was built to serve to uh, the uh, student body that you described today. I'd like to go next to uh, Chancellor Kristen Sobolik of uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis, uh, not far from Ferguson, Missouri, which saw um, a very similar set of circumstances erupt in social unrest just a few years ago. And what you've seen since then, and uh, a snapshot of what the campus looks like today might be quite illustrative, perhaps in telling us uh, what we might foresee in Minneapolis or not. And so I'll, I'll toss that question to you, Chancellor Sobolik. Yeah, thank you, Fred. I appreciate uh, the question and being invited to be a part of this important um, panel discussion today. The University of Missouri St. Louis is a younger institution founded in 1963. And in fact, we're listed on the US News and World Report for top performers for social mobility. We are one of the most diverse institutions in the state of Missouri and um, our diverse student population is here um, in Ferguson. So we have, uh, and we're also a part of St. Louis, which has a long history of structural and legalized racism and segregation. And of course that's um, similar to what some other cities have, but uh, to see that happening right here um, in St. Louis, even today, um, and we as an anchor institution need to really lean in and make sure that we are helping 
um, move that forward. But to talk about what Kate had said about a tipping point with um, uh, George um, Floyd's murder, and now going forward from six years ago in Ferguson, we had Michael Brown's killing. And in fact, just this Sunday was the sixth anniversary of his death in Ferguson. And taking a look at what has happened in those six years between um, Ferguson and um, the killing of uh, uh, George Floyd and, and being um, some, somewhat in essence chagrined and upset at what hasn't necessarily happened, where we're at now. As an anchor institution, it's important for us to um, be leaders in our community. And we are in a unique position to provide those resources and opportunities and leadership to advance the cause of racial equity in our own community, as well as serve as examples for others, because we know we aren't alone in this, but what has, has happened? I think UMSOL has um, been a leader in as an anchor institution, but um, what we see that has you know, happened in the last six years with Ferguson is that we have been able to um, accomplish some things, but not what, um, what we want to. And some of the um, one-time um, initiatives haven't necessarily led us where we want, whereas the more structural, foundational um, anchor institution um, initiatives have. But what's important too is as we are leaning into our community and being that leader, we need to look at our own internal um, community on our campus and analyze what where we are. So making sure that we're leaning in and we're engaging and empowering diverse for, um, voices across the institution has been important, but not much has been accomplished that we have wanted to. So these are some key points. I think it really sets the parameters and some guidelines for where we wanna be. And I think it's important as leaders that we make sure that we are moving forward. We don't miss these opportunities. We provide the foundational structure that's gonna be important for moving forward so that in another six years, we're not having these same discussions. And, um, and we have not accomplished what we need to as an institution, as an anchor institution, as a region and as a nation. And I'm, I'm hoping that as we get moving here today, we can get into some specifics of things that might have been triggered by the Michael Brown incident um, six years on, where do they stand and, uh, and, and what have been the, you know, what have you learned essentially uh, in, in trying to enact change in the wake of, um, of what happened in Ferguson. And I hope to come back to that in a little bit. Thank you so much. And we'll go uh, to our final panelists on the West Coast. The only person to whom we can say good morning on this campus, and that's President Thomas Parham, who is uh, at California State University, Dominguez Hills. And <clears throat> one of the things that really struck me about your many writings uh, is the notion of in, in all of this talk of change, what are we willing to sacrifice? And that really, I think, resonates with a lot of people. What are we willing to sacrifice? And you've shared in the past your own agitation at Penn, for example, for a curriculum that was more, uh, that would enable you to groom more culturally competent PhDs in psychology. Um, and I'm just wondering, how does that, I mean, how do you exhort people to sacrifice and define it in the context of the George Floyd aftermath. So Fred, thanks for, uh, <clears throat> for that. And let me say welcome to uh, all of our participants. Um, I wanna first of all, begin my remarks by thanking Kumu, uh, both Bobby Lauer and uh, Devor Lieberman, who uh, exercised, I think, a, 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 a a good deal of decision-making, I think, in really hosting a forum like this, which I think is such an important conversation. Uh, it was clear when Du Bois argued that race would be the most anxiety-provoking issue in America, particularly it would be the central issue in the 20th century. I think it is in the 21st as well. So anytime we can come together as colleagues and community to have these kind of broad conversations, I think it's always important. Uh, also want to bring you greetings all the way from California. Uh, George Floyd, uh, or Mike Brown, 
or Philando Castile or Sandra Bland or Breonna Taylor or Abad Omri or um, Amadou Diallo and uh, Abner Lawima. And it doesn't matter where you go, uh, Latasha Harlins from east to west, north to south, those uh, murders of black bodies really have a ripple effect uh, all the way across here. But I wanna bring you greetings really from the California State University system, uh, which is the largest system of public higher education in all of America that we're real proud of, but a very diverse place. So we wanna uh, be greetings at that. Now, when you talk about the question of what are we prepared to sacrifice, I think it's important if we can get into just a little bit of a, of a deep structure analysis on this, because our title and topic about where do we go from here is not just a, a, a fancy catchphrase, but it was more really taken from some of the writings of, of one of my heroes, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And it's important because context informs content, as my vice president reminds me, that where do we go from here was a theme and a question that Dr. King asked himself when he looked at the situation in America. He's coming off of 1964 and the Civil Rights Act, 1965 and the Voting Rights Act. And in 1966, he takes a retrospective look to find out that things hadn't changed much. So when he wrote the text and it was published in 67, it was really a retrospective look to say, where do we go from here? Because given all the advances that we were making with civil rights legislation, et cetera, the country still hadn't changed. And there were a couple of pieces that were about that. One is that the country was very much involved in an uh, empathic uh, uh, demonstration of, of, oh, we empathize with those poor folk who were being oppressed because they were looking at the films in Birmingham and the Bull Connors and the George Wallaces and National Guard escorting people to schools, et cetera. And they could see just the hard redneck racism that was blatantly there. But there was a difference, King argued, between the, the empathy that people showed and the quality that people were willing to embrace. Because they were addressing the question of empathy, aren't we sad for these poor folk who are oppressed? But nobody really thought about what does that mean in terms of equity? How do we create a, 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 a society that uh, manifests equality in a different way? And so it raises the question, as you first uh, uh, introduced, Fred, which is, what are we as a community prepared to sacrifice? Also, I think I should remind our, our uh, uh, viewers this morning that the empathy, I think, that happens a lot, particularly in the news media that you are so familiar with, when we have Ferguson, when we have uh, Minneapolis and George Floyd, the media is directing their attention to people who look like me and to black and brown bodies, to people who are oppressed, to people who are homeless, to people wherever, to ask them really, how do you feel? And really the, the, the challenge is not to know in this moment, how do people feel about their own oppression? You know we are angry, you know that we are hurt, you know that we are outraged, you know that we are nauseated, you know that we are as Fannie Lou Hamer would argue, sick and tired of being sick and tired. But what I wanna know is I wanna turn the focus a little bit and invite our institutions around the country to think about the challenge is not simply to, to uh, 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 gauge the opinions of your people of color, but rather I wanna turn the attention to brothers and sisters in the white community. Because what I've argued in my writings, as you know, is that racism fundamentally is not black people's problem. It's not Latinx people's problem. It's not Asian people's problem. It's not uh, uh, Native American people's problem. It is white people's problem. And we have to get our brothers and sisters in the white community to ask the question of one, how do you bear witness to the suffering of black bodies? Sit in silence and still maintain your humanity. And if we could get some people to begin to address that, then I think we begin to move the, 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 the needle along. Because what we've done over time is we still haven't fundamentally come to terms with the notion of what is a desegregated versus an integrated environment. We look at our, our institutions and we say, wow, but we've made so much progress. Well, you may have five, 10 or 15% of this, that or the other population, but Judy Rosner and Marilyn Loden in their text, Workforce America, remind us back in 91, I think, when they wrote that, if my memory's correct, that diversity is not simply about demographics. 
It is a question of whether the policies and practices of the institutions or agencies have changed as a function of the changes in the demographics and what the people in the streets are now demanding that we interrogate as institutions and educational institutions can't insulate ourselves from that conversation is do we really understand that we are not just in the community but of the community and are we prepared to look at the institutional policies and practices to see whether or not this toxicity of racism has infected what we do in the world that's what we have to be able to uh, to look at I'll stick with you then and as we you know go forward and dive a little more deeply into specifics when you bring your leadership and your scholarship you know that you just shared with us uh, to your campus. Tell us about how that has been ricocheting and any specifics um, that you have brought to the fore um, on your campus, especially when it comes to, um, you know, to bringing white allies into this pursuit of equity on, on your campus and specifically. So part of that discussion is happening, I think, with our students that we've when the George Floyd situation occurred, uh, I put together a town hall and along with my team, uh, no leader really thrives in absence of really members of their team really working with them. And we put together a town hall just to allow people to cathart and see how people were feeling about that. But following up on that, I've uh, instituted what I started out calling a task force on racial reconciliation that has now been renamed by the co-chairs uh, the chair of our Africana Studies and the chair of our Mervyn Diamond Institute on campus, uh, Dr. Nickel and, and Samad respectively, uh, the task force on uh, anti-racism in the academy. And so we have a group of folk, multicultural, who are now beginning to interrogate the policies and practices on a campus like Dominguez Hills, which is interesting because we come out and we're founded out of the social justice roots. We were originally founded in a place that is Palo Verde's and very upper uh, class and upper middle class. But after the Watts Rebellion, it was moved to the Dominguez Ranch, right? When the governor came down, this is uh, Edmund G. Brown, and said that we wanna create a gateway and a door of opportunity for the residents of the urban core of South Central Los Angeles. But I've tried to argue with my, 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 my uh, campus that we can't simply be passive participants to our own historical legacy. What we have to be doing is be actively engaged in trying to make sure that we, we look at closing the gap. There's always a gap in the human condition, right, between aspiration and actualization. And so as we look to try to be a more better institution, then part of the challenge is for us to try to look at seeing how can we interrogate our own policies and practice? How can we look at our curriculum? How can we look at ways in which we're creating a more culturally competent graduate uh, to take their place in the workforce? How are we looking at faculty? How are we looking at diversifying our own folk? What are the programmatic initiatives? How are we engaging the community? How are we brokering the conversations between police and the campus community and the surrounding community about how do we come together as a, as a community entity? Those are the rightful places that academic institutions ought to be assuming. And those are some of the things that we are doing on the campus of California State University, Dominguez Hills. Okay, I'd like to go to President Pribinow in, in Minneapolis. And you've mentioned that, you know, the big roadblock uh, on campuses is, you know, the whole system of tenure, promotion, control of curriculum, and then it's much easier to do diversity initiatives in the, you know, student affairs realm rather than on the academic side. Uh, talk a little bit about how you've attempted to move the needle when it comes to bringing change and diversity and, uh, and equity on the academic side when things seem so etched in stone and, um, and tradition bound. And for many good reasons, you have these, uh, these systems in place, but they're obviously resistant to change in many ways. So can you talk a little bit about how you've, you've dealt with that on your campus and then others can jump in as well? Yeah. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, and I think uh, you, you referenced this earlier, just be remind folks a little bit about the threads that have actually led to our historic identity as an institution. We were founded by 
uh, Norwegians back in 1869. We um, are an institution affiliated with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which happens to be the most white denomination in the country. Um, we are uh, have been shaped by a kind of Western liberal arts tradition at the core of our academic program. Um, and the truth is we're a, a kind of majority institution in the middle of an immigrant neighborhood. So you take all those threads and they actually represent whiteness kind of in all of its uh, you know, glory, if you will. Um, and I'm a 63-year-old white guy who happens to you know, now be finishing, you know, in his 15th year as president, and has the gift to be able to do that. And so I take Thomas's challenge quite personally. I'd be quite honest. I mean, I mean it's, it's exactly the right challenge. This racism is my problem. It is our problem as an institution that, in fact, needs to do this deep dive and and needs to change the way we do business. And I think this is what you're, you know, pointing to. Uh, just a quick example. Uh, I think there has to be um, kind of leadership courage around some of the inherited. Uh, traditions and practices that have in fact have shaped the academy and this has in some ways has nothing to do with our faith or um, or uh, northern European backgrounds this has to do with the, the traditional academic uh, kind of structure that we all probably all have inherited in some fashion whether it's in curriculum or whether it's in things like uh, tenure and promotion um, give you just a quick example um, of some of that courage we had a um, situation where uh, as I think most of your our colleagues know uh, most of the hiring of faculty is done at the departmental level uh, certainly with the involvement of uh, a wider circle of folks but uh, and those departments tend to want to replicate themselves I don't think any, that'll surprise any of us that is part of what they do when they lose somebody from up there who retires or moves on they think about themselves and how they would continue to you know, really benefit from the status quo and and I think that what it takes on occasion is for uh, leadership to step in and say, no, that's not good enough. Now, we can do things like change the way we train them on bias and discrimination and the hiring kind of questions they ask and the kind of systems they set up to do that. That's one step. But even with that, um, we will find, uh, as we did just several years ago at Augsburg, where uh, a department will have two really fine candidates, probably equal in their uh, ability to do the job as it's been described, who represent two different profiles, um, one being a, the more traditional status quo of that department, the other being someone who's actually dedicated more to our uh, real commitment to experiential education, to social justice. Um, the recommendation from the department is to hire the one who replicates the status quo. Um, the other one uh, comes in second in their vote. Um, a provost, my provost, a very uh, wise and experienced person steps in and says, no, we're going to hire the other one. Um, that's a, that breaks the traditions. <laughs> that breaks the inherited traditions of how this, these things are, tend to be handled. And when you do that, um, the truth is you get the result, uh, you know, bringing somebody of a more diverse background in, which is one step, but you also get the message to the broader community that we've got to change the way we do business. Otherwise, we will not uh, fundamentally change those policies, practices, mm -hmm. protocols that have been defined by, um, again, these inherited traditions. So just a really simple example, I think, of the kind of both courage it takes, but also the willingness to, to step into this work in a different way. It's not exactly an open arms embrace and welcome for the person who gets the job eventually and has to go into a potentially very hostile and unwelcoming right. environment. Um, systemically, yeah, is, uh, how do you address that? And, and, and after all others can weigh in. I would just say that it's a great question and, and certainly an important one. I think um, as we've built a, a more diverse faculty in response to our changing profile of our student body, uh, we've also built some strong um, networks of, of support and mentorship across the institution that, that help to support folks. I'm not saying it's easy. I, I think you're right. There certainly can be some uh, backlash on those kinds of decisions, but, um, but I think there's also a, a growing sense of accountability to, um, to the willingness to, to think differently about how we, how we go forward. How does that resonate with, with others? Uh, you know, how, you know, how about, uh... Sunny Buffalo. I mean, uh, Dr. Conway Turner. Absolutely, I I, I think that uh, bringing on diverse um, individuals to your campus is certainly a first step, but it's really the cultural change that needs to occur so that once the person comes on board, that they feel comfortable and that this is a place where they can thrive as well. And that's a harder lift. Uh, as difficult as it is to recruit. Um, uh, outstanding folks to change their culture so that they feel a part of it. And I think that as leaders um, throughout the, the Kumu network uh, and our very diverse environments that we're a part of, that we have to help model that appreciation for making those changes, those cultural changes on, on our campus. 
And one of the things that um, I think is important is embracing feeling uncomfortable. So a change does not generally occur when everybody is feeling comfortable. So you have to embrace that it is okay to have difficult conversations uh, around racism, structural racism, the things you've been doing. We've been around for 150 years, our campus as well. So things that you've been doing for many, many years, if they are not actually helping people feel comfortable on your campus, then you need different traditions. You need to incorporate different traditions. And so I think that as higher education institutions, as leaders, we have to give people the license to have those uncomfortable discussions and to do things differently than they've done before. And that will help to elevate a voice that perhaps feels that no one wants to hear from them. Uh, right now, post the um, George Floyd uh, tipping point, uh, there are many different new discussions happening on campus among faculty, among staff, among students, to really give legs to the social justice that we have been talking about. Those are not easy discussions. I can tell you there have been some stumbles along the way where people step into a space and people misunderstand them or they really reflect some bias in the discussion. We've gotta be willing to have those discussions. Otherwise, white allies will not be able to understand how to be part of this discussion. So it can't just be the black and brown people, as, as Thomas said, that you know, are having the discussion. It's gotta be everybody. And so the comfort with uncomfortable discussions, the comfort with having someone say things that really need to be called into question, we've got to develop that. We've got to develop on our campus. And, I, and from the rich discussions we're having, having now, you know, it's, it's really beginning to happen. And it's all because of the tipping point that we're in. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, I learned a lot in, in the coverage of development work um, in poverty alleviation is, bringing change will never work and behavior mod will never happen when people are shamed into it. Uh, and I am just wondering uh, whether you can weigh in any one of our four panelists uh, or, or all of you on how you get the buy-in from people who represent in whatever way the tradition or the status quo, uh, whose earnestness and good faith you have to assume, and it's probably true for the most part. How do you get the buy-in uh, to suggest that um, you know, yes, there's a bit of sacrifice or perhaps the pie can be enlarged as opposed to divvied in smaller, uh, in smaller wedges. Who wants to take that one on first? Go ahead. So one of the things I would, I would say in, in answer to that, Fred, is that um, the goal of, of closing the gap between aspiration and actualization is not a function of having to shame or denigrate anybody. I mean, one of the fundamental things I try to uh, teach uh, not only people in seminars I write or students I teach or even patients I've seen over my life is self-affirmation should never be contingent upon denigrating anybody. And so part of what we have to do is, is get to the deep structure to pe first of all, help people learn that. The other fundamental lesson we have to help people understand is that because you stand up to say, I am pro something, does not mean that you are anti something else. That is a, a mindset that people have adopted that whenever you stand up and say, I'm pro feminist, you must be anti-male. When I say black lives matter, it must mean that white lives don't. That's, a, that's, that's, that's the kind of uh, you know, intellectual gobbledygook that people deal with all the time that is really not true. And so part of it is, is trying to help appeal to the goodness of folk. I mean, the out and out hood wearing, card carrying clan members in the world are relatively small. I think most of the human condition is very, very good. So part of you know, my approach would be to try to appeal to the goodness in people to say that I believe you want to be the best you can be. And so the discussion is really about trying to help facilitate closing the gap. And, and Kate is exactly right. You know, the, in, in Freud used to have a concept called um, uh, that I'm blanking on now that I'll remember in a moment, but lay folk have a much better expression. Uh, Freud called it the law of inertia, but it's, it, lay folks say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you can't make people uncomfortable with what it is they're doing, then there's no motivation to change. Change comes from within side. 
And so believing that people have the out and out best interest at heart of wanting to be the best person, the best institution they can be, then part of our posture has to be, how do we help you do what you already say you want to do and believe in, but you are struggling with because I can look at the gap between what you say and what you do, and the gap is too big, and how do we help you close it? That, I think, is a posture that I would invite us to think about assuming. Anybody have an anecdote that might illustrate the point of, uh, of inclusiveness in its grander sense um, of bringing everybody together and, you know, to see their they're better angels, any specific examples. And I realize that one may not immediately pop to mind, but especially recently. I think that um, I might just offer a, a quick sense. You know, I, I have the gift of a, uh, I can use a theological language sometimes in the context of my leadership. Uh, you know, and this, what, this, what you're really pointing to is the difference between people falling back into a lens of scarcity and everything they do, that everything is about loss as opposed to the notion that we can actually create abundance. Um, so um, I, very quick example, when we started to see the transformation of our student body, um, it's not that Augsburg didn't have a commitment to diversity, but in fact, hadn't seen the kind of change in that profile uh, up until about 15 years ago. You know, so initially faculty were like, you know, what's happening here? You know, why, you know, what this is changing. This is changing the nature of the classroom. Um, and what started to shift there in the narrative and in the culture was the recognition that those students that were coming to us from these different backgrounds and different life experiences were actually bringing um, uh, knowledge, uh, bringing ways of knowing, bringing life experiences that actually enhanced the, con the, the classroom and made it a richer, more robust uh, learning environment. Um, you know, so some ways liberal arts, we get stuck in a particular way of looking at, and, but in fact, at its base, the liberal arts is about, you know, what uh, Parker Palmer calls the grace of great things. You know, this notion that we come around an issue and we bring our different perspectives to bear. And so in very much in keeping with that, uh, that tradition, this notion of abundance shows you that you actually can create something. And I'll, I'll quote, uh, you know, Fred will, you know, our great uh, late Senator Paul Wellstone, you know, we all get better when we all get better. I mean, that's the, that was his motto. And that's uh, in some ways, uh, I think a more positive way of talking about, I think again, shaming is not the way to do that. It's about trying to show people evidence of, of abundance. I was going to go back a little bit to some of the things that I heard in, in your opening remarks. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned, Kate, was this whole notion of, uh, you know, of having come to a point and you say, we have not come along as we thought we might have come along these, in the past half century. Uh, and then go to St. Louis and ask you, Kristen, whether you can tell us a little bit about, you know, the proximity in both time and geography to a major trigger in, in a triggering incident like the Michael Brown one to say, Specifically, have you witnessed changes on your campus that are meaningful? Um, are, you, are you seeing a lot of um, complexity, uh, texture, et cetera? Give us a snapshot of what the campus looks like today uh, that you might not have witnessed um, you know, a few years ago, pre-Michael Brown. Mm -hmm. So I think you wanted me to start uh, with a few reflections. Um, you know, I think that what's, what's happening is that uh, people thought we were farther along than we were in the issue of breaking down racism. And the reality of today has showed us that we have a lot more work to, to do. But we have done some work and we have changed some minds and we have, you know, moved ahead in, in some ways. And one example was uh, when the um, um, George Floyd uh, uh, murder occurred, I called on my foundation board to immediately um, develop a scholarship in his name. So uh, that's the kind of thing that sometimes takes weeks to discuss. You know, we've got a, the, that, this person versus that person and whether it happened immediately. And I think that that is the moment that we're in, that there are things that are now clearer to members of the community so that it seems like, of course, of course we need to memorialize this event. Of course we need to symbolize that we are going to be a better institution than we were before. And of course we're going to establish the scholarship immediately without any discussion, a unanimous vote, bam, it was done. A second example is that um, my archivist 
uh, found out just a few weeks ago that one of our buildings on our campus is named for someone who enslaved African-Americans. We did not know this, uh, so he brought it to the forefront. Once again, the trustees met the same week. We removed the name. You know, we now will make sure that when the building is renamed, it will be named for someone who we really feel is a hero or a shero in our world. So things are happening. There's a lot more to be done. But what I'm seeing is that the speed of which people are willing to make some changes has really increased in the moment. And that's why I say we've got to capitalize on it. And we've got to continue to use this moment as a time to make significant change that will be lasting, that we can't miss a moment. A perfect segue to you, Chancellor Sobolik, about you know, what is the arc of such an opportunity before um, life retreats to a pace that it had before that opportunity? You know, taking a look at the discussions that we've been having on our campus, we don't want to get life to, you know, back to the pace that it was before. We can't step back into the old ways of doing things. And this is an opportunity for all of us, both in, in our campus and externally to our campus, to address some major structural issues. And um, so the arc, I think, is here, and it's structural, um, which will be sustainable, as well as the cultural issues. So when you take a look, I'm a new chancellor. I have been here, I think, four months um, at the institution. So I'm analyzing a lot of what has been um, happening here uh, at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, all the, the great things. And what we have seen and what I hear people talk about is um, with regards to Ferguson, how integral we were in helping um, that community because that community is us. That community um, through those times. We, for example, we have um, a number of, you know, we provided hundreds of hour, hours of services to area students and teachers at that time in clergy residents. We have um, a center for trauma recovery, um, but in some of those things have remained. But um, keeping that engagement um, in the community is what, um, is, is what we're, we're trying to focus on now so that we don't step back. And being an anchor institution, we're very infused. However, internally, now, I think putting inclusive excellence, which is a part of our strategic plan, and we talk about it all, all the time, making sure that that is um, what we're focused on so that it becomes a fabric of our institution. If we talk about it, if we as leaders, I think um, it was Paul, our, um, you know, um, Paul talked about leadership courage, making sure that we are speaking um, about inclusive excellence, we are talking what we need to do and then infusing those into conversations and then it becomes a part of, of the reality. I also wanted to indicate that, you know, to reiterate what um, had been said previously is that we don't, we can't be afraid to have these difficult conversations. And I think now people are stepping forward and are much more willing to be in those uncomfortable spaces, to have those difficult conversations. Um, because once you open up that space, um, it is it, it is interesting and it's in generally positive to see what actually happens. And those sometimes have been conversations or spaces that haven't been open um, previously. How about some examples of things that your eyes have been opened to in the George Floyd aftermath or even in the Michael Brown, although you're a new chancellor. Mm -hmm. I mean, are there examples of things you look at and say, gosh, we should have been doing this all along and we, haven't been. Uh, visit failures, if that's the right word for them, and, uh, and share a little bit uh, mm -hmm. by show of hands. Okay, go ahead. And then okay, um, for with me. So for example, I have one of internally and externally, but I'll start with the external. You know, being an anchor institution and how involved we are in the community, one of the things that I feel with St. Louis, again, being new, um, is that we are very divided. And we're not only divided with regards to the politics and the economics, but we're divided with regards to the institutions and the support structures, the framework 
of um, St. Louis. So we, um, being the anchor institution, we should not just focus on our immediate um, neighborhood. We, I think, need to reach out um, more and engage with the larger institutions and framework frameworks within St. Louis to make positive change across the region. And I don't know why we haven't um, done that as much. We, I, I know that we're new and I think we've uh, relied on being new to the scene um, for, for too long. So it's time for us to take our leadership um, role as that institution that is um, for change, that is the diverse institution, that is the public institution in St. Louis and reach out to our regional chamber more, to the civic progress, to our um, the uh, governmental structures. And we haven't done that. So I would think that that's, I guess you maybe want a failure, but it's an opportunity for the future. And it's, it's past time for us to seize that opportunity. Any other sort of swift kicks? Yes, um, what I would say is that we, um, unlike Kristen, have been doing a lot of work in the community. Uh, but I think that our task now is the internal work, the curriculum. The curriculum is very hard to move. And we have made some marginal changes over time, but already this summer, there have been faculty coming together to talk about real significant changes and pivots in the curriculum so that social justice issues become something that permeates each and every student that goes through Buffalo State. So that's always been hard. I mean, you know, they'll have, every fact they've been a part of, this is not just Buffalo State, is that you can spend weeks, months, years talking about revisions to the curriculum, and then you end up having some very small tweaks. And so I'm really thinking that at this moment in time, there will be some significant changes based on the energy and the passion that I'm hearing from faculty around the need for our students to be better prepared in understanding the real history, the broad diverse history, and not just the, the Euro-American tradition. And so I think that this is gonna be a moment that uh, we can really sort of make some major curricular changes to general education that have been resistant to change and every, all of the five institutions that I've served in has always been very difficult. And I, I wanna to go to, uh, to President Parham next because it brings to mind um, your agitation as a young scholar, untenured at the time at Penn, um, for a, a curricular change, which is um, which has been instituted, and in now at Penn, as you uh, have pointed out. But what about the pace of change? I mean, did it did it take too long? I mean, that is a huge factor as well, is it not? Um, change needs to happen at a particular pace. How do you measure it, and how do you decide that it's that it's adequate? Can you shed a little bit of light on on your you know? stemming from your own experience? Yeah, thanks for the question, Fred. I mean, it's, a, it's a, a great point because one of the other pieces that Dr. King observed in that where do we go from here text was not only the what were people prepared to sacrifice in the context of trying to push equality, you know, uh, in terms of the whole society, but for the more radical element among the, 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 the people in the streets, um, were they prepared for the pace of change? And the pace of change at that point was very, very slow. So for me as a young scholar, uh, when I entered the University of Pennsylvania, this is early 80s now, 1982, I'm a brand new PhD, 27 years of age. And I'm told, I didn't know this before I went, I don't know if I'd have went there if, if, uh, if I knew this in advance, but, and I probably would have, I loved being at Penn, it was a great institution, still is. But it was um, in a space of being the first African-American academic psychologist the University of Pennsylvania ever hired. So as I'm now part of a faculty who is training counseling psychologists to go out and deliver uh, services, these are masters and doctoral level clinicians that we're training in that department. I asked a question as a simple query in a faculty meeting to say, excuse me, but we live in a city that's 44% black. Philadelphia had just gotten its first black mayor then in Wilson Good from the days of Frank Rizzo, who was known to be very um, uh, uh, 
I have a whole different posture. And I said, the American Psychological Association, whose ethical standards that we adhere to, suggest that one should not practice outside of one's competence. So how do we train doctoral students to go out and render psychological uh, services and care to a population and you have no courses in African American psychology or any multicultural counseling. Somebody help me understand that. And even colleagues who were friends uh, whispered to me and they said, by the way, that's not a way to make tenure. So part of the challenge that I had to be able to navigate was not just, I think, the correctness of the argument, but also, you know, what was I prepared to sacrifice in order to use that? Because what most of us do is not have a question about what is the right thing to do. Most people can know that. I think most people have a, a pretty good moral compass, but it's what are you prepared to sacrifice and give up when you get to those positions? And so for me, what's dangling at the end of my nose as a young scholar is, will you make tenure and get promoted? What's dangling at the end of my nose is you're an Ivy League professor now, can you keep your job? And maybe I was confident enough, perhaps even arrogant enough to believe that as long as I write and do my scholarship, I would be there. Sheldon Hackney was the president then, Tom Orlish was the provost, wonderful individuals, both of them white males, very much had a social justice conscience and they were there. And in fact, even in my wife who happened to be the affirmative action officer at the University of Pennsylvania back at the time, who was doing some magnificent work out of the president's office and trying to help the institution to be more better and stop on those kind of searches you were talking about earlier. You know, those are the things I think that were going on then uh, it, it just allowed us to raise the question about what we were prepared to sacrifice. And I'm reminded always about the words of the great Algerian psychiatrist, Franz Fanon Fred, because what Fanon argued, which is a question for all of our participants on the, on the uh, Zoom call today and the webinar, which is if each generation has an opportunity to fulfill its legacy or betray it, then part of what we have to get up every day and do as presidents and as deans and as administrators and as provosts and as department chairs and as faculty is are we prepared to fulfill or betray the legacy that we've been blessed to inherit? In my life, Fred, if I go back in history, it would cost me my life if I knew how to read and the slave master found out. Literally cost me my life. So I go to work every day with a mindset that says, how dare me not be willing to sacrifice something like tenure or a job and believing I somehow can't get a job in any old place around in America because I'm, I'm too afraid and scared to do that. The ancestors who came over in the halls of those slave ships, right, were the best of what we had to allow us to survive and assume this place of mastery over the world that we now occupy. I can't do any less, and I think our institutions can't do any less, but the fear is real. And the consequences are real. The question is, do we, are we prepared to just sacrifice what it is that we you know, have in front of us in order to try to push the margin to try to create right, a more better society and, and, a, and a, a better union? I want to get, get to the question, however, of gauging the pace of change and its appropriateness. Is it going to take a generational shift? Is there patience for it? Uh, it'll never happen at that, at, at that race, uh, you know, at that rate. So, uh, I mean, what is an acceptable change of pace? I mean, how do we get beyond the tyranny of, of incrementalism, if you will, um, of cosmetic changes, of changes that happen uh, in the wake of very emotive incidents like George Floyd? How do we sustain them? And how do we measure whether they're changing at a pace that, uh, you know, that points in the direction of equity? Yeah, I might just... Ooh. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, just weigh in on that because I think that that is, uh, I want to go back to Kate's point about the, I mean, there are certain things that we are able to do now quickly because of this moment. Um, I think as a president, what I am focused on is thinking about what are those things that we can do quickly that actually plant a seed that actually will uh, grow into something sustainable for the future. And that, that's why I see this moment as particularly poignant because we have a chance to do that. I and mean, I'll give you a quick example, um, two quick examples for us. Um, um, we had a proposal uh, that had been moving through its process over the past uh, 10 or 11 months to create a new critical race and ethnicity studies program at our institution, uh, something our students had been asking for. You know, that could have taken years. Um, but when it came forward at this moment, um, I said yes, the 
provost said yes. We agreed to hire three faculty members. And by the time we get to this point next year, we will have a critical race. And that's just, I mean, that's un, unheard of, you know, in the context of the academy. Um, we have a, uh, we do a lot of interfaith work because of our neighborhood. And we're doing uh, remarkable work right now on the intersectionality of race and religion, especially with our Muslim neighbors and thinking about racism and Islamophobia. That's work that is being energized by this moment. Again, going back to combination of where we are in place, but also, I mean, that's, that's work that had been coming along and it wasn't that we weren't doing good work, but it's now as a new sense of urgency to it, uh, funding coming in to help support that. And that that's the kind of thing that I think from, from a leadership standpoint, to think strategically about where you can plant those seeds now in this moment to allow something to grow um, uh, and become sustainable. Uh, that that is, I mean, I, you know this, Fred. I mean, that is remarkable in the context of a higher education um, kind of setting. So, mm -hmm. I, also, I, I, I want to just build on that point. I, I agree with everything that Paul said, that this is the moment that you can really plant the seeds. But also, we're all in the industry of uh, looking toward the future with our students. So it's going to also be sustained if we do what we need to do to make sure our students are prepared to lead in courageous, authentic ways as they move forward. And so, I mean, to me, that's what gets me up every day and gives me energy is to realize our students are the future and that we have the opportunity of planting the seeds in our students to make those tremendous differences and sustain them. And so that's really a blessing to be in higher education uh, because right in front of us in our classes, we see how we can actually make this continue on. May I just, Jump in on that because I think uh, that's really great, Kate. Uh, and you know, I've because of our population and because the Twin Cities are have so many large corporations, Fortune 500 corporations. Uh, I've actually had more access to HR offices and some of these big companies than I might have had, you know, 20 years ago because they see our students as the future. And and I got to tell you, I walk it. I mean, for all the equity work that we've done, the inclusion work we've done with our students, with our faculty and staff over the past decade, when I walk into those offices and they talk to me about our students being prepared, I have to ask them, are you prepared for them? Are you a corporation? Are you prepared for a student who, in fact, has been shaped to think about these questions, has been equipped uh, and educated to come in and make change happen? Are you ready? And I hope that one of the things that's coming out of this moment is I hope that the corporations and the businesses that are claiming to take this moment seriously will take it seriously and do what they have to do to become spaces where our good students who come out shaped and educated and formed to be able to care about these issues, in fact, are going to find um, a place where they, uh, they can pursue that work in a healthy way. And that uh, I just think there's a real interesting moment here that, that we can't control, but I think that we can certainly encourage uh, with our colleagues in the business community. Yeah, Fred, I would also add to what, what Kate and Paula just said, because I think the, there are a convergence of factors right now that make this specific point in time, at least in my lifetime on this planet, different. Um, because people are, are much more engaged and motivated to change. I mean, you know, it, it, when we go back to the George Floyd situation, you go to almost the depths of despair looking at this, the, the inhumanity that was reflected on to George Floyd by that police officer, and not just him, but the other three who stood around and looked and watched and act like somehow that was okay. That's, that's just, you know, the level of human degradation there is just something. But you go to the height of feeling empowered when you look at, at Black Lives Matter activists in the street joined by Latinx folk and Asian folk and white folk and old and young and seniors and men and women and gay and straight. And there's a coalition of people rising up to say, yes, Black Lives Matter in the context of that. I mean, that's what's changing. And so even for us here in California, for example, uh, as I put together this Race and Reconciliation Task Force that later changed its name uh, just within the last month, I have faculty saying, I want to be a part of that because in our department of dance and theater, they had their own task force where they were working on this issue. And in another department, they're looking at it. And I challenge the academic Senate. In our legislature right now, there's a, there's a debate about whether we should have a, uh, a, a, an assembly bill 1460 that talks about a mandate of an ethnic studies course that would impact the CSU. Some of the resistance has not been on the substance of the bill but rather on the legislative intrusion into the curricular affairs that really are the domain of the faculty. 
But short of that, it also is an indictment of those of us in higher education who haven't done the job we should have done that would invite the legislators to come in and say, look, we'll do the job for you if you're not prepared to. But what I've challenged my team to do, and I've challenged my academic senate, I've challenged different departments that even if the bill were successful, one course does not a culturally competent individual make. And the level of cultural ignorance in this country is so pronounced right now about people who are culturally different that we've got to be able to train folk who are much more culturally competent. So I've challenged our faculty to say, I don't want to you know, follow the leader. I want us to set the curve on what it is that we ought to be doing as an academic institution to create a new generation of students who are more culturally competent. And it's in everybody's best interest to do that. I mean, Fred, I have, as my colleagues here that are on this panel, probably more degrees and letters and awards behind our name than most people have fingers and toes combined. We've had blessed lives. But if I take off my Dr. P label and my coat and tie, and I walk down in my you know, sweatsuit you know, by Nike and I'm on the street, I see people who will come and have literally crossed the street when they see me coming will keep going and then recross again when they think it's safe. Because on television, the only three images you can see is of a black man in particular, is you either gotta be an entertainer, athlete, or a criminal. And I gotta believe that if they thought I was an entertainer and athlete, somebody would be running to get my autograph. What they're running from is somebody who they think is a predator. So I can't be Dr. Parham on the street or when I get stopped by the police and they say, get up against the wall and throw a, a racial epithet in my way. And growing up in LA, that was part and parcel of what LAPD was like back in the day. I've right. been in those spaces. So I empathize with that, but I think I've seen a coalition and a, and a coalescing of, of different elements now in society that are gonna uh, accelerate the pace of change if we're willing to do and join with our younger generation of people who are really showing amazing courage right now at being able to lead this fight. Okay, I would suggest to you as we, um, as we start to wrap, wrap up and wind down that uh, we are in a more polarized time than you suggest. And uh, despite you know, the coalitions you see coming together, which are very, very visible and, uh, and arguably very powerful, we are in an election cycle in an extremely politic, uh, politically polarized time uh, where we're talking about housewives in uh, the suburbs, um, you know, that are the president of the United States has said he is uh, pledged to, you know, to protect from low-income people um, and crime. He's describing your geography in many ways, uh, the geography of your campuses. Um, how do you navigate the world outside of the nurturant campus, the bubble, if you will, that all of you have created. And I'd like to go to you, Chancellor Sobolik, because you've seen a lot of this. You are in a fraught environment in Missouri, uh, politically speaking. How do you navigate the world out there at a time like this? You know, getting back to what Kate had said about the leaders right now, I think, you know, are our students. And the best way that we are, we need to lean in to navigate um, that environment is through our students. When you take a look at St. Louis and, and the University of Missouri, St. Louis, 75% of our students live and work in St. Louis. They have internships and jobs out in the corporations in the broader area. And they're the presidents and CEOs and CFOs um, of those corporations. So having um, our students on our campus um, take that leadership role, as they turn into alumni, they are out in the, um, the area and they are successful and taking those leadership roles and then coming back and reaching in um, to uh, embrace our students. I think that is one of the best ways is, is having our successful students there listening to them and having them lead. But it is um, beyond um, our reaches of our campus. I think um, that's where it gets um, more treacherous. And I think for us as leaders, we need to, to model the behavior and um, be as positive um, as, as we can and making sure that we are moving forward um, our, our institution and putting our inclusive excellence speech 
and framework um, where we go, where we go. And I want to, you know, uh, dive a little more deeply and, and personalize it a little bit as a, as a white leader in a politically polarized time, in a racially polarized time, and race and politics have mixed uh, to toxic levels by some descriptions, arguably. Can you give us some personal insight into what that is like from your vantage point as a white leader, a white female leader, if you will? Anything that you can you know, share with us that gives, you, gives us a sense of perspective, and I'd like others to weigh in as well from where you sit. Well, as a white leader, I'm very aware of um, the institution that I lead. I'm very aware of my privileged background and where I sit, not only um, you know, as a leader, but as a white woman within our, our organization. So I lean and work with and make sure I am having a lot of conversations with our leadership team that is a diverse team. I'm making sure that I am making um, conversations and having input with, uh, with the region as well. So I think um, what's most important is to be very aware of yourself and what your failings are might be you know, as a leader, but what also your strengths are. And I think um, having an open mind, building very diverse teams, thinking about inclusive excellence as the fabric of everything you do. Um, I think that has been important for me as a leader. I'm new um, as a chancellor. So I'm excited to learn about St. Louis, reading a lot about the history, but also relying on the people who've been here and can better help me, help guide me and to understand um, the region. It's not as easy as you make it sound. Uh, is my guess. What's been difficult about it? Well, right now what's been difficult is making sure that I know who, you know, what the different um, political lay of the land is. I had also previously talked about the divisions that we have in St. Louis. We have a lot of municipalities here in St. Louis County and the division between St. Louis County and St. Louis City um, has been interesting to navigate but making sure that I'm making the connections for my institution. We had a previous chancellor before me who had been um, chancellor for 16 years. And so I would say at this point in time, some of the biggest, um, I guess, hurdles or obstacles, things that I focus on in my everyday um, existence is maintaining and re-engaging those important connections for my institution and for my students, particularly at a time in which we are remote. Um, we have COVID times, we have people that, you know, very tumultuous times, but at a time when things are changing exceedingly quickly. We had previously talked about um, just the time frame for change. Things are changing drastically right now, which is amazing considering that frankly, we aren't, um, most of us physically even on our campus at this point in time. So keeping up with that all, um, being as positive as I can and making sure that I'm listening to thought leaders, not only across the nation, but particularly within my institution. So that's the most challenging thing um, for me on any given day. One of the guiding um, discussion points uh, that Bobby Lauer uh, laid out earlier is the whole discussion of addressing um, you know, the institution efforts to change an oppressive system that the institution itself helped create in the first place. And, and uh, Paul Pribinow, tell us a little bit about how you earn credibility, um, you know, leading up to this moment. I mean, how do you earn credibility in uh, communities where presumably that was, uh, it wasn't abundant to begin with? Right. You know, it's a great question. And I, you know, to Christian, I think I uh, can build on what she said. I mean, this, uh, this, this is first and foremost personal work that I have to do for myself. I mean, I grew up um, 
in of situations of great privilege. And I've, I've had to come to fully realize that. And, and we put in place a whole variety of, ish, of tools on campus to help our campus. Uh, we all, we require that every faculty and staff member take the IDI, uh, which is the Senior Cultural Development Inventory. We develop plans to help them grow in their intercultural competence. So there are things we can do institutionally, but personally, I have having to do that work. And I think that what I have learned um, in these 15 years at Augsburg um, is that uh, both personally and institutionally, um, you have to come to this work, this important anti-racist work with a, an epistemological uh, humility that um, doesn't come naturally <laughs> to the academy. <laughs> Let's just say, um, I, I always say we have to get over ourselves. Um, and I think about that both internally um, in the ways that this work gets done and uh, how we do navigate. I mean, so we're bringing right now, for example, uh, our uh, chief inclusion officer and a team of folks are interrogating every policy and practice that we have in place administratively and academically through the lens of equity. And what they're finding is, again, a whole variety of inherited traditions that just uh, nobody went back and looked at, but they, in fact, are obstacles mm -hmm. to creating the kind of anti-racist work we have. Um, Kristen has pointed a couple different times to St. Louis's, uh, Missouri, St. Louis uh, role as an anchor. That movement, which many of us are involved in through Kumu, uh, thank heavens for their great support, in fact, has as its core an epistemological humility that as we come to the table, um, with our partners in the neighborhood, and this is for me one of the things that's certainly serving us well at the moment, with a sense of mutuality. Uh, not that I come with expertise that I impose on my neighbors, but I come with self-interest, but also seeking shared value. And I think that's a very powerful model for us to think about any of the work we're doing, but especially in this time, when I come alongside my primarily Muslim, Somali Muslim neighbors, um, and we think together about how we can create a healthy, safe neighborhood. You know, I've got to give up um, something in order to uh, be a partner in that work, to walk alongside them, to listen carefully to them. And I think, so I, I think, you know, that notion of humility um, in the ways that we approach this work is just critical um, on both the personal and an institutional level. One of my most uh, vivid recollections from years of doing development work, and this is an anecdote I'll share from uh, years ago in South Sudan, where the Carter Center is doing a lot of work in the eradication of a condition called guinea worm. And uh, it is an extremely distressed, extremely remote and war-torn region of the world and difficult to work in. And the Carter C um, Center's success, uh, according to its medical director, Don Hopkins, is being a good listener. And the one thing that he said that really stuck with me, he said, all of us as humans, no matter what our background, uh, how much we are educated, have a sixth sense for condescension. And there's a lot of it uh, in the world out there. And I suspect, you know, part of being a good listener um, is that. Can, um, I'd like to hear from, uh, from uh, Presidents Parham and Conway Turner on the issue of race at a very personal level uh, as you come to the table to negotiate with the community at large and try to build this mutuality. Um, let's go with you first, uh, Dr. Conway Turner. Yes, so um, we're situated in a very diverse community, right? On one side is what's called the West Side, which is a very um, international immigrant community. On the East Side is a large African-American community. Uh, I grew up, uh, actually, Kristen knows, I grew up near her uh, campus in uh, Missouri in a small town and a very um, uh, poor area. Uh, and so I actually find it um, myself easy to integrate with my diverse communities around me. Uh, both my lived experience as an African-American woman, lived experience of a struggling uh, in terms of poverty, really allows me to relate well with the diverse communities that are around us. Uh, what I find interesting is sort of um, not uh, falling prey to being naive about the divisions that you mentioned earlier. We are an extremely politically divisive country right now. And I know that my colleagues tell me that people will say things to them, my white colleagues, that they would never say to me. And so I have to listen very carefully to understand the undertone of what may be the bent of someone who really is seeming positive toward what I'm talking about, but in reality may not be. And so it takes a different kind of um, 
political savvy and understanding when you're a person of color uh, than it is. So it's, we both have work to be done when we work with our communities and representing our communities, but I think it's different work for someone who happens to be in my package than maybe Paul or Kristen uh, have to, to face. Uh, but when I'm working with people that feel differently about my community or diverse people, I really take an educator role and I want to give them all the good evidence of why they need to support our diverse community and that I don't give up on people. And so maybe you don't come to the table with me on this issue, but I'll keep working on you and hopefully it can find some common ground that will allow you to support our students, our community, and the way that Kumu campuses really do, reaching out and becoming anchors. But it is different work when you're a person of color than when you're someone white and you, and the dynamic is different and um, you don't always hear the upfront things, so. Yeah, I would, I would echo. That I think. sounds very tiring. <laughs> a lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> it is. So, uh, it we're is we're coming to the end of our, our time very soon. So, but, but in, in, in short, I mean, how do you uh, sustain the stamina? Uh, let's go to uh, President Parham on this. Um, and I sus suspect he speaks for many people. How do you sustain the stamina uh, and lead, uh, you know, in the midst of these polarized times? I mean, at some point, you know, there's, a, there's an old gospel tune that's a favorite of one of my mentors, Horace Mitchell, that talks about some time I don't feel no ways tired. And so when I think about contextualizing struggle, um, in my office, I used to keep a picture of, in fact, it's in my faculty office at the university, of the ancestors in the slave dungeons in Elmina and Cape Coast. And I keep a picture of Malcolm and Martin with me because it always reminds me as a leader to contextualize struggle. And so if you understand what people had to go through to get you to this place, then that provides me with the internal motivation to not be tired at inconvenience when for them, what they were dealing with would really cost them their life. So, you know, it, it isn't for me even equal, but engaging the community is a tough one. And I want to be quick about this because I know our, our time is limited, but what I try to do is assess, you know, one of my, my, my teachers, the great Joe White, uh, African-American psychologist taught me, he said, one, you should never seek validation from your oppressor. One of the most fundamental lessons that he taught me. But he also said that you always, any system which you go into, you have to assess where are your allies and where are your alligators. And it didn't matter whether I was at the University of California as a student, whether I was at Wash U in St. Louis as a graduate student or Illinois in Carbondale, whether I was at Penn or back at Irvine and now Dominguez Hills, or down in the community of LA, uh, you know, across the basin, there are always allies and alligators. So I try to stay away from the alligators, play to the allies because there are plenty of allies who are there. So when I go to the LA Economic Development Corporation, when I go to the LA Area Chamber of Commerce and look at their leadership, they're willing to collaborate around a whole range of things. So I spend time with the allies and not much with the alligators. But also, people are looking- Don't you need the us. alligators? Say that again? You have to deal with the alligators, don't you? Sometimes you do, but sometimes you don't. I mean, I, I think about the kind of energy that is there. Again, my, my assumption, right or wrongly, is the out and out people who are the hood wearing card wearing clan members in the world with the cone on the head are very few. That most of the people there are fundamentally good. And it's about inviting them to do that. What there are is the, the racists in the world are not big. It's there are not enough anti-racists in the world who are willing to engage the struggle. So I'm really playing to that piece. You know, the, even in the polarized elections, you have folk on the left and folk on the deep right. We're not in a fight for the folk on the deep right when a president says I can shoot somebody in the middle of Times Square and people will still vote for me. I can grab women by their privates and they will still vote for me. That, that, that crowd is just hook, line and sinker in that space. I'm in that middle space trying to talk to those people who at least have right, and open mind to say, look, let's take a look at how this works. But I wanna say that for me, we've gotta teach people one to listen. Corner West reminds us about listening to the psychic scars and, and the ontological wounds and the existential bruises that are so much a part of the fabric of our, our circumstance and situation. If we can get our colleagues to listen, that's good. Secondly, we wanna invite our colleagues to be risk takers. They have to fundamentally be risk takers, mental risk to think differently verbal risk to say something, even if it's stupid, 
And on the off chance that people will trust that your intent was honorable, even if you make a mistake. And we also have to be behavioral risk takers to think about as all of our colleagues here today doing something different. And lastly, we've got to be able to hold people accountable, right, in ways in which we haven't been holding them accountable before for the change we expect to see. And it's that accountability measure, I think, that is the single most important ingredient missing from a lot of the inclusive excellence and diversity conversations that we have. Because if, if, if any of us are $100,000 in the hole in a year, we're, our jobs are on the line because they value fiscal integrity. But if somebody doesn't reach a diversity goal, who, who cares? That's what we have to do is hold people accountable for the change we want to see. On that note, we're going to have to bring this this session to a, to a close, unfortunately. Um, and unless any of the other three of your colleagues have something that's just itching to get off your chest, uh, I will say, I don't see evidence of that right now, but I wanna really thank you uh, for a spirited conversation, which uh, as I said, on the Kumu platform um, and uh, can continue and it's an ongoing one. And I hope that uh, amongst yourself, uh, yourselves, you'll have uh, an exchange of ideas to, uh, to take this forward. Uh, stay tuned, as they say. So once again, uh, Dr. Kristen Zobolik, Dr. Paul Pribano, Dr. Thomas Parham, and Dr. Kate Conway-Turner. Thank you so much. Thanks also to Bobby Lauer at, at uh, Kumu and uh, to Debbie Dar and Mikey Mullen uh, for enabling all of this to come together. Thank you so much and all the best. Thank you. Thank you.